There we go. Here we go. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it, Justin? I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like that. That's really smart. Spot on. Right. Three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. Yeah, uh, here with Scott, and across from me is Callum. Hello, hello. How you doing, mate? You very right? well. Yeah, yeah, very well. How you doing? Yeah, very good. Good very man. Good. I've had my coffee. Yep. Likewise. Go. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I'm well rested. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> as rested as I'll ever be. But uh, <laughs> yeah. How's your weekend been? Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Due to the weather, it's uh, can't say I've been out too much. Uh, to be mm. honest, <laughs> avoiding it at all costs. Saying that, I went for a run Friday night and then Saturday morning. So oh, excellent. we've not avoided it that much, but <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> no, but not. Uh, well, I'm, not I'm too back bad. in the gym today. You are myself back back after me wow. uh, yeah. my January blues, yeah, the Christmas oh, yeah. blues and all of that. <laughs> yeah, that fucking time I get Absolutely, back into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> I know that feeling. But how's yeah. um, how was your weekend so far? So far, so good. Yeah. Um, Proper good, good evening last night. Went to go see the Circus Horrors, uh, yep. Circus of Horrors, even. You did, yeah. At the at the Town Gate in Basildon. The Town Gate, yes. That's Lovely, darling. A prestigious <laughs> venue. <laughs> Lovely. But, but no, it was it was actually pretty good. Is <laughs> oddly enough, I haven't been in the Town Gate for probably about fifteen years. It's a lot smaller than I remember it being. <laughs> yeah, Joe. I had the same yeah. um, the same feeling, but for very different uh, reasons. I actually got my second COVID jab. Oh, it, did you? In the theatre, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretty Actually, sure they still had the... the signs up and everything for that like, vaccination <clears throat> centre and all of that sort of. Yeah, gumph. pretty sure it was. It was in the main, uh, the main room, mm. and um, I think it was actually on the on where the stage would be <laughs> is where they had all the like the little booths lined up. So yeah, it's tiny, isn't it? If that's not telling something, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what is. It's it's all just an act. It's all just an act. <laughs> <laughs> love from that film Sucker Punch, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's all done on the stage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, but yeah, yeah, not too bad otherwise. Yeah, so... Uh, good. Yeah, all good. Ready yeah. to dive yeah, into the episode, into man. Yeah. Well, well, before we do that, we... Uh, of course. Obviously, our usual shout-outs to our Patreons. Absolutely. So we've got James, who's yeah. our Rambler. He is. And we've got Thank Justin, who, has, who is our keen Rambler. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Justin can see us right now because he gets a, a lovely little video. He gets the privilege. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he can also see that we're in a slightly different room at Hellfire. Yeah, slightly different. Yeah, um, they've slightly had a bigger. little bit of a move around. And um, yeah, it seems, to, it seems to work pretty well so it, far. It does. Yeah, so far so good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, as we're talking about Hellfire Creative... Um, This podcast is recorded and produced and sponsored even, not produced, sorry, just sponsored. Sponsored. (laughs) By Hellfire Studio, Essex's first podcast film and photography studio situated just 45 minutes from London. Hellfire Studio also offers full creative content creation. Visit hellfirecreative.com for that. Yeah. uh, but as a listener to the King Ra- to the uh, Cryptid Ramblers podcast, what's going on? I don't with know. You today? put your teeth in this <laughs> morning. <isn't> <laughs> this is going to be a long episode, man. Intro take two. <laughs> <laughs> that bell, by the way, is yeah. our uh, is a gift from our King Rambler, Justin. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we've we've uh, we've introduced it to the episodes now. Thank you very <laughs> we much. We are. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So as a listener of this yes. podcast. Cryptid Ramblers podcast. If you stick around after if all that. If you stick around. <laughs> <laughs> We're not a good advert, are we? <laughs> you could take full advantage of 20% off yep. and uh, with a, a discount code of Cryptid yep. um, at the checkout. Just go to hellfirestudio.uk for that. So Absolutely, don't go to yeah. hellfirecreative.com for That's for all the, the info. That's for all the info. Go to hell, hellfirestudio.uk yep. to actually make your purchases. Yeah. Get your bookings and such. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, this um, this episode is a little bit different to what we usually would do. Yes, um, it is. Well, yeah. we, new season, new format, I guess. Really, we're yeah, just we're trying, trying new ideas it up a little bit. And um, this actually is a Patreon question or questions, should I say? <laughs> yeah, ain't that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ain't that right? Um, so this um, these questions were posed to us by James. Yep. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, and, thanks, good uh, man. I uh, you know you're quite excited to hear what we have to say about this. Um, and we're at least going to try and um, potentially 
answer some of these questions because they're very they're very specific very open and it's something that I've certainly thought about for a little while and it was quite interesting to see that he had something to, to ask yeah um so I'll run through the the questions that he's posed to us and first of all it's in relation to the younger Dryas uh, time period yeah um and more specifically the younger Dryas impact hypothesis now if anyone that doesn't know that there's someone you can search for it's called graham hancock <laughs> go check out what he has to say about it um and there's a, a particularly a particularly good podcast that he did with on the joe rogan experience yeah um and he had uh, a geologist randall carlson on there who brings the knowledge <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's fully stocked up with slides yeah. and like, over like nearly a thousand slides it's a joke yeah with photos and graphs and he's he takes he's, you to school on it oh, doesn't he? <laughs> he really does well you watched it didn't you i did like oh my I god did. that's incredible so yeah um, it's brilliant give you a quick rundown guys of, of what the um younger dryas impact hypothesis is mm. and so the younger dryas time period um is a period in time where the earth experienced rapid temperature increases and then rapid cooling resulting in global sea levels rising approximately 400 meters so this occurred around about 12,800 years ago mm. um and it was right at the very end of the last massive ice age yeah. that we had um this is said to have occurred around about 12,850 years ago as i said and um the, the hypothesis is that it was pieces of a huge asteroid that broke apart and struck the northern hemisphere, causing the North American ice sheet, which at the time was two miles thick. Yeah. <laughs> two miles thick, thick of ice. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it caused it to rapidly melt, mm. um, resulting in a million, millions of gallons of meltwater to cascade across the North American continent, wiping out 75% of all flora and megafauna. Mm. And when... Megafauna is things like um, giant woolly rhinos and mm. uh, mammoths, mammoths yeah. mastodons, and the, yeah. the, the large creatures. So the big boys, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the big boys. And there's a lot of evidence of like um, where they found mammoth um, carcasses and such mm. where they're, 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 just, they're just destroyed. Like they're, they're snapped. Their ankles have snapped. Yeah, skulls crushed in, yeah, yeah. limbs snapped. Food still yeah. in their mouths and, and stuff yeah. like this. Still so it's like food. it happened, bosh, yeah. done and dusted. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about like massive tidal waves blasting coastlines globally, uh, earthquakes on pretty much every fault line, volcanic eruptions all around the world. Um, like I said, the, ev the evidence for this is overwhelming. Um, mm. in, in forms of like deposits of platinum, high temperature spherules, uh, milk glass and nano diamonds, all yep. sort of things that you would associate with impacts. Mm. And they've been able to find this over, I think it was something ridiculous, like 5 million square kilometers across the Northern hemisphere. Yeah. Um, and they just found it in this, uh, black layer. that just looks like everything was scorched. Right. As well. Um, but also, on top of that, in 2018, a crater measuring 19 miles wide was found under the glacier in Greenland. Mm. And research is, is still underway, but the current dating is incredibly close to the start of the Younger Dryas time period, which right. is in, very, very interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're going to attempt to try and answer James's questions, at the, or at least yeah, get started with them. Yeah, it's uh, a sort of... As we said, it's sort of a, you know a bit of an amalgamation of a number of sort of points or, or questions that, mm. that he raised that all kind of flows from that initial um, time period or, or mm. you know sort of mass event as you know as you rightly say, um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting one. I think we're gonna it's going to be a little bit more of a conversational piece. This one, which which as you said earlier, is a slightly different format to. You know how we've done things before, um, which is yeah, it's quite quite exciting. It's quite different. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm quite interested to see what um, <clears throat> what I've found and what your take is mm. on it as well. Yeah, because again, we we don't consult on our sort of off the fence or our sort of research, um, you know, too much. Certainly, mm. so we don't know where each of us are going. Well, uh, we, so we there's tend any to kind just of... go like, this is my bullet points, and I, that's all I'm willing to give you yeah yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> I, I read this 
Yeah. That's all I'm letting you know. Don't read it. <laughs> yeah, Don't exactly, read into yeah. that. Don't read into it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it'll be good to, yeah, to see if we end up going down the same the same route or whether we come at it from from different angles. I know, in, in terms of how we're going to present our evidence and, and theories, we've gone about it slightly differently mm. in the sense that yours is going to be more. This is right up my factual alley. based, I guess, and more of a sort of a presentation of the evidence based on you know mm. kind of what we may have both found out in you know the last sort of few weeks and mine I've I've gone about it to actually so I've broken James's question down into sort gotcha. of five or six points okay. and I've gone about answering each one based on you know kind of what, what I think based on what I've read so it's yeah, more of cool. a direct yeah. you know sort of answering well, of the but hopefully you do it before me <laughs> well hopefully some of what I have to say ties into what you've got yeah, going on to, to help really. back it up so that'll yeah. be that'll be interesting to see what we've got going on yeah. After this then. So Yeah, definitely. Um so James's questions, um so like I say, in relation to the younger dryas impact hypothesis, um, what if the said event and high strangeness goes hand in hand? A civilization of people able to pass through or interact with different realms nearly wiped out by a mass extinction event. Mm. Could some of them have been able to escape to another realm in some form of ritual portal? Did some sorcerers, priests, or druids stay to stabilize the portal and or open it at a later date? Has that portal or portals been left partially open? Um, has the knowledge of these portals and how to interact with them been lost over time? And are later monuments an attempt to harness enough power to reopen said portals? Right. Yeah. What a humdinger. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. 42. <laughs> it's goodbye from me. <laughs> yeah. It's goodbye. And, good, and goodbye from me. <laughs> All right. See you later. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, get back really to good. it. So, um, yeah, we're, like I said, we're going to attempt to try and answer some of this stuff. And um, like I said, this is really sort of right up my alley. Because yeah, absolutely. Looking into the deep history and the deep past and and such, and I, I, it fascinates me. And I've had mm. to really kind of curb my enthusiasm with this one, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I really have had to. Um, but the first thing that I want to talk about really is um, is what the ancient cultures would have worshipped. So what the actual cultures would have been like. And mm. I want to get started with um, the idea of a serpent worship. Okay. So at the moment, we often think of like serpents as something evil. Mm. So when you think of serpent, you often think of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It tempted Eve with the fruit of yeah. from the tree of life or the tree of knowledge, depending on mm. how you want to interpret that. Um, but that seems to be a very recent thing. So only mm. in the last couple of thousand years at the very most. So last right. 2,000 years. Yeah. So... There are literally thousands of interpretations given to the sim symbolism of the serpent that we yep. find in ancient texts, artwork, sculptures, and structures as well. It seems that to this day, the Christian church would have you forget about serpent worship altogether. Now, there's a very good reason about that. But first of all, I will talk about um, the origins of, of the word and where the roots of it lie. Okay. So more importantly, the related words that give us the various terms around the globe, the serpent or snake worship, because I want to have you guys understand that there potentially could have been a global civilization mm. rather than it just being little pockets yeah. of various cultures from all around the world. So snake is known in the language of Canaan as several different um, audibles. Okay. So we've got ob, ab, ub, ob, of, op. F and Ev as well. Okay. Amazingly, in the Mayan language, Khan means serpent, as in Kukul Khan, which means feathered serpent. So the feathered serpent was their deity that basically started their culture, it taught right. them how to do what they do, it taught mm. them agriculture, taught them building and as such. Right. Um, just as in ancient Sumerian, Akan and Scottish Khan means serpent as well. Right, okay. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, comes from the ancient Babylonian Khan for, for serpent and Vol for fire. 
showing that there's an etymolog etymological link from like, thousands of miles. Mm. So all over yeah. the place. Um, also Vatican as well. So the Vatican in Rome comes from the word vatis, meaning prophet, and can, meaning serpent. So oh. Vatican basically means place of serpent worship. Wow, okay. Or well, certainly cer uh, place of serpent prophecy. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah. In the Bible, King Saul um, appears for a prophecy from the oracle who is called one that hath op, um, or the priestess of op, the snake. So again, the prophecy coming from the snake. Um, as a, an ancient culture, watch up. So, the snake worshippers of Moses's time and area were known as the Hiphites, um, derived from Hiphia, which means serpent, which is the root of Eve. Oh, okay. Mm. So the Hiphites uh, evolved into uh, Ophites, who were like an early Christian Gnostic serpent worshippers um, in the in the second century AD, I believe it was. Um, as it turns out, the children of Israel, who are the descendants of Jacob, son of Isaac, um, and then son of Abraham, as in the Abrahamic religions. Right. They intermarried. So the children of Israel intermarried with the Ophites and often served their gods. These people were known by another name as Baalim, or meaning the people of Baal. Okay. So I don't know if anyone's up with their um, biblical knowledge or such, but there is a god or a false god in the bible called baal and baal was a serp uh, was a, a solar god thought to be an abbreviation of ob el the serpent god or shining serpent now according to arthur bryant a writer and historian the greeks referred to him as uh, belia which was interpreted interpreted to mean uh, the dragon or great serpent okay bel is an Assyrio-Babylonian version of the gods Enlil from Sumer, so the Sumerian gods, mm. and Marduk, which is from Babylonian, um, also being the same as Baal. So there's uh, an evolution yeah. of these various different gods that have a basis in serpent worship. So could it be also that Beltane, the Celtic fire and sun festival, could actually be referred to as Beltan, both words signifying dragon or serpent. Now, That's interesting, yeah. Again, showing again a cross-continent link uh, to Europe from yeah. Mesopotamia. Now, I want to actually talk about the idea of shining. So we all know about the film The Shining <laughs> and such and understand the concept of shining from that film. Yeah. So shining was the idea of illumination, believed to be achieved through altered states of consciousness, whether that's through... Um, drugs or meditation mm. or, or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's, this idea has been replicated across the globe in a lot of ancient cultures and even you know in the New Age push today as well. Yeah. So according to many ancient cultures, this is actually not true enlightenment as they readily pointed out that true illumination derived from knowledge of one's own soul and knowledge of a greater work of the gods, or as we call it, the universe. Mm. So this leads us to other knowledge, that of the stars. True, so yep. in truth, the serpent is seen in the sky shining down upon us in this form of constellations and even the Milky Way. Okay. So often, often uh, described as being a serpent, but more obvious celestial body in symbolism is yeah. the sun. Yeah. There's a huge link between serpent worship and sun worship. And the, and the sun is often depicted as a serpent. So in a circular fashion or it's wrapped around mm. the sun in some form. So if you do take the time to go and look at some of the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and such, mm. you will be able to see how much sun worship was linked mm. with serpents. So um, another ancient culture that located close to Egypt and for the most part forgotten to the public um, is a North African civilization of Carthage. Okay. Um, which is situated in situated in what is now Tunisia. Right. Now, gotcha. the patron god of Carthage was Tanit, or Tanit, um, who was associated with the Tree of Life, 
like um, Ishtar and Anastati. And she, def- she definitely crossed cultures into Europe mm. as well. Now, Carthage was um, a maritime rival to Rome, um, whose empire actually spread into Morocco and into Spain. And I don't know if you remember it, but do you remember the, the story of Hannibal, who crossed the Alps to attack Rome? With his Briefly, elephants. not. I can't say. I couldn't recite it, but yeah, I, I'm yeah. aware of it. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I I remember hearing about that as a child mm. and hearing about Hannibal cross the Alps with um, his elephants to attack Rome. Right. Well, he was Carthaginian. Oh, okay. So he actually came from Carthage. So it's based on the of what we know about the the Carthaginians genetically. Yeah. It's probably more um, accurate to to suggest that they were Southern Mediterranean rather than North African. Right. So if that makes any sense. Yes. Um, often the tree of life is depicted um, with wavy lines in either the bark or, or the, the tree leaves itself. And it's said to represent serpents and emerging of the serpent form. Yeah. The name Tanit, who was the patron god of, of Carthage, means serpent lady. And she is found to on many coins in Carthage associated with the caduceus as well. So uh, yep. anyone that doesn't know what the caduceus is, that's the um, the staff that Hermes carries. And it's often a, a symbol that we see with medical profession. So right. it's a staff yep. with snakes wrapped around it that would symbolize what a lot of people seem to symbolize as DNA. Mm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, she's very much... Um, associated with the caduceus symbolizing her role in life death and rebirth right she is basically the same as the queen of heaven astarte or isis or mary oh okay it's exactly the same idea right yeah here the serpent is associated with the cycles of the moon Mm -hmm. um, as the the divine feminine right whereas the male serpent the the two serpents that interlink with the caduceus um, is so the male one is actually the divine masculine, which is the sun. Okay. Um, the one being the mirror of the other, mm. essentially. Makes sense. Which does make sense because they are exactly the mm. same size as it appears to us. Yeah. That's how we get those eclipses mm. and such because it's it's almost like it's designed that way. It's a bit yeah too a bit good. too exact. Yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> um, so this relates to the early Christian Gnostics that I previously mentioned the Ophites, um, and they go right back to Babylonian beliefs of serpent worship, which in turn goes across to uh, Egypt and Mesopotamia and towards the African ancient serpent cults. They stretch as far down as South Africa as well. So we're looking at this sort of belief system going into sub-Saharan African. So Christianity then is related to the most ancient worship known. And if it were not for the destructive covering up of huge amounts of data, <laughs> then this would have been a lot more obvious. Yeah. Because uh, Jesus is essentially a sun god. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's uh, an ancient Roman god called Mithras who is incredibly similar. Right. Incredibly similar to old JC. So, right, okay. Very, very similar. So... It is a fact that the Christians of antiquity were ashamed of this link and did everything they could to destroy it. Um, not least because it revealed that their own deity was the sun itself. It wasn't anything special. Right. Um, and it wasn't anything new. So we know that the, the Christian Gnostics were called the Ophites, but they deferred from modern Christians in a big, big way. Now, we're talking about uh, this. I want to read out a little bit of a quote here from uh, Epiphanius. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Take that if you will. <laughs> and he was the uh, the bishop of uh, Constania in uh, Cyprus. And he, he was the bishop from 310 to 320 AD. And he says this about the Ophites. The Ophites sprung out of the Nicola- Nicolaitans, and Gnostics, and were so-called from the serpent which they worshipped. They taught that the ruler of this world was of a draconic form, and the Orphites attributes all wisdom to the serpent of paradise, and they say that he was the author of the knowledge of man. They keep uh, a live serpent in a chest, and at the time of the mysteries, 
entice him out by placing bread before him upon the table. Opening his door, he comes out and having ascended the table, folds himself around the bread. They not only break the bread, but distribute this among the vol- the uh, votaries. So votaries meaning the devouts. Right. Or disciples. Or disciples. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> what you mean? Controversial. Yeah. <laughs> but whoever will may kiss the serpent. <laughs> That's two. That's me telling all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> sounds a bit... Um, you may gi- kiss sound- the serpent. You may kiss the serpent. <laughs> <laughs> sounds a bit Jim Jones, that, doesn't it? Yeah. Now drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> kiss the serpent and drink the Kool-Aid. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, this is the interesting bit. This, the wretched people call the Eucharist. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Now, they another name for the Eucharist. Communion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they conclude the mysteries by singing a hymn through him to the Supreme Father. So they sing the hymns to the serpent and hoping that right. it gets to the Heavenly Father. Right, okay. Mm. So Sounds this is... Awfully different. familiar, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> very, very familiar. And uh, might have you understand why mm. early Christians would have you, you know, not think that they were serpent worshippers as yeah. well. <laughs> Um, This is incredible because it tells us, like the ancient Egyptians and the uh, Mesoamericans, Mesoamericans even, the serpent was symbolic of the sun and must be constantly enticed to rise. Aren't they all? Thank you very much. (laughs) Oh, thank you. (laughs) I didn't think we were going to use this. No, I didn't. uh, It's worked out perfect. Overused it. (laughs) Three times in less than half an hour. There we go. Bodes well. Yeah. So uh, kissing the serpent is a simple <laughs> revelation, revelation even, that the sun feeds us and giving life to our agricultural world. Right. The Eucharist med- uh, mediator is the serpent, um, as Christ was the mediator on the cross, a symbol which and act for that has a much more ancient meaning, but I've, I won't go into that too much. All I will say is that I found that the cross is, um, is the, the symbol is actually derived from the Egyptian Ankh. Um, but that is for another time. But right, okay. The, the circle on mm. the top of the Ankh is um, symbolic of the serpent and the sun. Right, okay. But the, so again, just more connections with different cultures and religions. and Yeah. But I just want to make everyone aware that it does seem like I'm going a little bit off on a on a tangent with the serpent worship, but it is closely linked with the sun, and it will become apparent as to why mm. I've gone through this, yeah. why I've started off like this. Um, the Eucharist of the Ophites relates to the Roman rites of uh, Barcus, where snakes are carried in baskets of cake and bread, and the food then being given to the devout followers. In this uh, Bacchanalian rites, there was also the consecrated wine that was handed oh. out. Remarkably, this ritual used a special chalice or grail um, called the Cup of the Agatha Demon. Oh. Mm. Now, wow. Okay. That might relate a little bit yeah. to our previous episode. But the Agatha Demon means a noble spirit or good serpent. Mm. Okay. Mm. So I also want to make everyone aware that demon meant something very, very different back then as well. Demon was yeah. almost like what they called your subconscious, mm. but a separate to that, the um, your spirit guide. So demon was something that was a spirit yeah. guide to you, not necessarily what we think of you know, the Christian sense of a demon. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So um, this cup of wine was passed around the altar at supper, much like it was at the... Last Supper of Christ, and received with much shouting and joyousness as well. Okay. But heading over to Britain now. Oh, okay. The chief title of the British serpent god was who? Who? You do. Who? Do what? What? Remind me of the bee. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. I know, right? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so who... <laughs> Who was the dragon ruler of the world? I don't know who. Who? You know who? That's what I'm asking. Who was? 
Oh, is it get out of our system now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll get it out. And we're done. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Are we? <laughs> no. No, we're not done. The bell's still here. <laughs> the title probably given to, like, given them as Hias, it's a similar sort of derivative of uh, the Bacchus. So the Druids were known as the uh, Gnadas, um, now known as an Adda. And the Adder was always the symbol of their god, who? <laughs> I won't. <laughs> I can see you I'm holding like it itching, in. Like, it's like, like, like that, yeah, like the picture of that kid. <laughs> of the veins. Like, <laughs> so it is believed that the Druids were um, originally offites of the original stock as well. Oh, okay. So they worshipped um, another god called Belly or Belli. Um, and there was a... Belli was a, a Celtic god, a sun god, and is often depicted with serpents. So mm. in this respect, the Druids were probably the last true serpent-worshipping priests within Europe. And we know that the Druids were referred to as serpents because the Christian, well, certainly by the Christians, because mm. of the story of St. Patrick of okay. Ireland. Now, St. Patrick was said to have driven the snakes out of Ireland and this is not to be taken literally because there was never any snakes on Ireland. In fact, Ireland actually, um, its etymology is the land of the wolves. So uh, okay. there was a lot of wolves on Ireland. Um, right, okay. But yeah, there was never any snakes Interesting. on Ireland. And that is referring to St. Patrick driving out the pagans. So the, the serpent worshippers. Ah, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. So it was these, his conversion of the people to Christianity over... The, the pagan pantheon yeah. that they previously believed in. Right. Um, but as we've realised from our previous season, the Irish aren't so easily converted. <laughs> no, they're not. Um, they tend <laughs> to hold on to what they've got. That they do. So <clears throat> according to Herodotus, um, a sacred serpent was fed honey and cakes once a month at the Acropolis in Athens. These honey cakes were marked with the omphalus. And the omphalus is a religious stone artefact. And... Uh, the belief around the omphalus was widespread, like the serpent belief, all the way from India to Greece. So what they call that, call that um, uh, Indo-European. So it goes from the right. Indus Valley uh, towards India and actually going into Europe as well. Um, it's a boss or an orb with spiral, spiral lines carved into it, and it very much represents serpents coiling around it. These are similar markings on ancient stone monuments across the world, especially at Newgrange in Ireland. Ah. And it's interesting about Newgrange yeah. as well, very, very, which I'll come on to later on. Okay. Uh, Quintus Curtius, a Roman historian of the first century, also pointed out that, the, that in Africa there were such stones with spiral lines said to be a symbol of their serpent deity as well. And when I'm referring to Africa, I'm talking about North Africa. So... Upper right. um, Sahara, not Sub Sahara. So, have you ever heard of the Etruscans? I have not. Okay, well, the Etruscans were the progenitors of the Romans. So, they were the culture that came before them and they right. used to paint their, their bodies in red ochre. So, right, okay. Um, and that derives from the Phoenician people who also did the same thing. And they came from the area of the, of the Mediterranean that's known as the Levant which is now modern-day okay. Israel yeah. and yeah. Uh, Palestine and that, that sort of area. Um, and the Etruscans, they used the omphalus and they saw it as a route to the underworld. Now, again, that is also another strong um, link that serpents have. They have a, a, a link to heaven. Mm. They also have a link to the underworld yeah. or what they call the underworld or potentially another realm that exists alongside our own. Yeah. So I found that I found that more modern day symbology of the serpent um, that depicts the fall of such a belief system. Mm. Now, if you look at various coats of arms, um, especially in Europe, you'll find that there's an eagle with a snake in its beak or in its talons, mm. um, and it, it, this represents a triumph over the serpent. So, the, okay. one that does come to mind straight away. It's not in Europe, but it's Mexico. So the Mexican right. flag has um, a serpent being um, consumed by an eagle. Um, the United States eagle often has a serpent in its beak, whilst also having thunderbolts in its 
uh, talons. Right. Um, like I said, many European coat of arms, and even St. George's Dragon. St. George and the Dragon, even. Right, okay. So, and it's often said that St. George came from Syria, or at least that area of land that is now Syria. Oh, right, okay. Or I believe they say um, Syria or Anatolia, which is Turkey. Turkey, yeah. Um, and yeah, he's destroying the dragon. The patron saint of England is destroying the dragon or the serpent, serpent oh, okay. worship. So serpents have always been associated with a path as well from one place to another. Yep. Um, there's various places across the world that have, have been given the name of the serpent trail. Mm. Um, the trail of the serpent, which is I mentioned very, very briefly in, I believe, our elves episode, and that rely, uh, referred to the tribe of Dan. Oh, yeah. Or the Tuatha Danan. Danan, yeah. Danan. <laughs> Tuatha Danan. <laughs> That's the one. Um, there's also the Serpent Mound in Ohio, which, again, has a very, very strong link to the summer solstice. Right. So they, they discovered this a number of years ago, and the Serpent Mound actually, from above, it looks like a snake making its way across the land, and its mm. head is directly lined up with the summer solstice as well. Right, okay. Um, and there's even snakes and ladders <laughs> as well. Yeah. But with the snakes, you're going back. Yeah. So in modern times, the snakes have that sort of negative aspect about them, whereas previously... Yeah, it was quite the opposite. The, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a way of moving forward. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the reason why I started with the serpent worship is because it, it's so closely linked with that worship of the sun and its own links to stone monuments around mm. the world. Yeah. So all these stone monuments that are linked up with um, the sun worship and mm. things that are aligned with the sun. Yeah. Um, that's why I wanted to start with that, that there was such a strong worship of some of, of the sun. Of in the that sun, form. yeah. And when you look at it, go and look at serpent worship or serpent symbology over mm. time and you will see how much that's changed in maybe just a thousand years mm. and potentially how long these this serpent worship was actually going on for. Yeah. It was going on for a lot more, lot longer than it hasn't, if you understand yeah. what I yeah, mean. Yeah, it makes sense, yeah. Um, so I actually, with that, I do want to talk about um, this, the science of a lot of these stone monuments and in particular mm. i want to talk about the pyramids so the pyra a, a pyramid shape at the very least right and what i came across was quite highbrow oh right it was quite okay. highbrow and it was um some experiments that were performed by um a, a dr joe parr he was jd um the letters after his name i forget what they actually stand for but right okay him and his team um did some experiments with pyramids in the early 70s. What, but the one I want to talk about is where he aligned a, a large pyramid um, in lab conditions, so mm. as large as it could possibly be, but he lined it up with the cardinal points, north, south, east, west, um, and he used a microfarad capacitor, which is a small device that stores electrical charge to create a spark um, across the, the, the gap sort of thing, um, between itself and the pyramid. And the idea was that that was supposed to signif uh, to emulate the electromagnetic signals of the Earth yeah. or what okay. they call the Earth energies that, they, yeah. you know, that you know, YouTube Gaia yeah. now yeah. refer to, you know, <laughs> the Earth energies, <laughs> raise your vibration. <laughs> Which, I'll take the piss, but I kind of subscribe to a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I did wonder. <laughs> yeah. So the purpose of it, like I said, was to simulate the electromagnetic energy of the Earth passing yeah. over the pyramid because it happens in waves. Mm. So the team involved registered the, the changes on a daily basis and recorded the strange phenomenon. The What they found was that it was an energy bubble that surrounded the pyramid yeah. itself. Um, strangely the energy actually stopped all kinds of radiation and the bubble showed a re a reduction of um, beta emitters. Mm. Ion sources and uh, magnetic sources when monitored from inside the bubble. So it was basically stopping stuff from coming in. Yeah. Feeding negative ions into the bubble actually intensified the energy. 
and the energy was found to alter over the course of the year. Um, and they actually conducted this over 13 years. It's a long-term e- experiment right. with this, and yeah. they were able to really get a good, um, what they call it, a base reading mm. on everything that, that, that involved in this experiment. The strangest, okay. the strangest part being the effect on gravity within inside the bubble, um, which is heavily linked with electromagnetic radiation, which I'll go into yeah. a little bit later on. Um, it appears that the bubble actually blocked out the force of gravity as well as electromagnetic electromagnetic energy showing a 113,000 times increase in kinetic energy. Well, I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. maybe mm. they the ancients found this spot yeah. that they could create this bubble in. Sort of manipulate. Yeah. And then they built a bloody big pyramid, maybe. Because it, it is on an energy line, mm. apparently. Um. This led researchers to theorize that the pyramid actually moved in space and time, a place known to theoretical physicists as hyperspace. Uh huh. So, okay. if it exists and can move outside of gravity, then mm. it um, automatically goes into this altered state, mm. which is known as hyperspace. Okay. So, over the 13 years of experiments, um, the team were able to distinguish the movements and its directions. Yeah. They found that. When the negative ions were fed into the bubble, that the pyramid was drawn toward the moon and its movements around the world, um, and positive ions moved it away. So now, on a spiritual level, this signifies that um, the moon is often, as I said before, um, related to the divine feminine, what with the moon cycles and feminine cycles as well, that they, you can be tracked with regards to the moon's movements. Right. Um, okay. And this correlation actually indicates indicates that there is a spiritual negative aspect to lunar worship. So it was more sun worship than there was lunar worship. And if there right. was lunar worship, they were considered witches, mm. sorcerers, a negative aspect to the divine right. masculine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know. <clears throat> Um, also it's, it's actually worth noting that in order to, in order for certain hormones to be released to achieve a certain, an altered state of consciousness, so Mm. a trance or something like that, then various electromagnetic frequencies need to occur. So those people that tend to meditate will have, um, a frequency playing or certain music playing. It's not necessarily just to, to calm your soul or or anything like that. Because essentially what speakers are, they are electromagnets yeah. that bounce at a certain frequency to create a certain sound. So the idea is that your body is becoming in tune with that sound. Um, right, okay. And it's that in itself is, we've only really sort of figured this out in like the past 50, 60 years. Um, but it seems like the ancients had a much better understanding of it. But right, okay. I'll go into that later on. Um, um. <laughs> So, yeah, like I said, so the electromagnetic energies can be experienced through the medium of sound, which I, like I just described. Yep. One researcher, Boris, said, try Googling <laughs> just, just him. Boris. <laughs> try Googling him at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, Boris said, um, believed that the Great Pyramid of Giza was built with a sonic purpose. So, and I'll quote what he's, what he's had to say about it. Subsequent experiments carried out by Tom Daly not the Tom di- Daly. Not, not, not the diver. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Someone on the Change your career. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just switched it up just before. Uh, in the King's Chamber, or so-called King's Chamber, in the Great Pyramid, and the chambers above the King's Chamber, suggest that the pyramid was constructed with a, son- with a sonic purpose. Daly identifies four resident frequencies or notes that are enhanced by the structure of the pyramid and by the materials used in its construction. Okay. The notes form an F sharp chord, which according to ancient Egyptian Egyptian texts was the harmonic of our planet. So we already know if you go and watch Graham Hancock's stuff on the Great Pyramid, he gives you all the numbers. I'm not gonna bore you with them now, but they are incredible <laughs> numbers. Yeah. Like the dimensions of it all, it's all in relation to the earth. Mm. And it's it's yeah. just absolutely incredible. Moreover, Daly's text 
uh, uh, tests, sorry, show that these frequencies are present in the king's chamber even when no sound is being produced. They are frequencies that range from 16 hertz down to half a hertz. Um, hertz, because hertz is not plural. Well, <laughs> which is well below um, human hearing. According to Daly, these vibrations are caused by wind blowing over the, the ends of the so-called air shafts. Very much in the same way you would blow on the end of a bottle. Yeah. Other scientific studies have very, so that's that's basically what you're saying that, that it seems like it's just like a giant fluke almost. Mm. Um, yeah. Other scientific studies have verified that the Earth's resonance um, it, it does actually resonate at a frequency attuned with F sharp. All oh, right. Okay. So they've actually been able so to actually tried, out. Yeah. So you can also go and um, hear the sounds of the other planets as well. Wow, okay. NASA have been able to um, discover because most of the time people think of telescopes, they think of like Galileo and such. Yeah. No, they don't use those sort of telescopes to to view things. They mm. use radiation telescopes, sound telescopes, radio, all those, and then they compile the data and create an image out of it, mm. which is why a lot of people think that space is fake. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Came across a little bit of that yeah. on this as well, oh, to be God, honest. I was right. like, oh, my God, Dear drop little, me out. Yeah. Drop yeah. me out. <laughs> Um, so, that, I mean, that's astonishing that we've been able to discover that the Earth is is sitting at a, a resonance mm. of F sharp. Um, and the fact that the ancient Egyptians knew this is astonishing. Mm. Um, so Boris said, goes on to say... <laughs> Boris said, go, go to work. Don't, don't go to work. If, if, if you need to go out, don't go out. If, but go if, out. If you need to stay at home... Don't stay home. Go out. Have a party. Have a work meeting. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, I've lost my place now. <laughs> Sorry. Good grief. That was my fault, that one, to be honest. Um, Boris goes on to say that um, in a later interview that the Native American um, Native Americans made flutes that were in Oregon in particular. Um, right. That were also tuned to F sharp. Okay. Um, it's also worth pointing out that the importance of certain stones in connection with electromagnetic um, waves and such. Mm. So the stones of these um, tuned passages, so the um, the air shafts and the various different places that you can walk inside yeah. the pyramids, um, they're made of granite, um, a specific. Uh, paramagnetic rock so possibly because of its high crystal content so we know that there is a a very Makes specific sense. link with yeah. electromagnetic um, waves and crystals in particular so boris also said <laughs> don't <laughs> i'm really gonna have to curb it and i <laughs> yeah. so boris also said that the so-called sarcophagus that's found within the pyramid the great pyramid um, which has never had a body in it, by the way. Oh, okay. Never had a body in it. Um, it made made from a single piece of granite as well. So it's actually a carved piece of granite rather than a couple of different bits mm. um, cemented together. And it's actually attuned to the same frequencies as the pyramid, which, um, again, resonate anywhere between 16 hertz and half a hertz as well. Now, in... 1988, Dr. David Diemer, professor of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of California, made another chance discovery. Dr. Diemer attempted to find the vibrational frequencies of four base DNA molecules. Removing all the technical bits, it was actually found that the pitch, um, which shows up as most frequently, and is tuned to F sharp. Right. So we've got the Earth that mm. resonates at F sharp. We've found that the pyramids themselves resonate at the F sharp, and mm. four base DNA molecules that exist within all of us mm. are attuned to F sharp as well. So this is why right. the idea of you know if you go walking barefoot out in nature, the the New Agers say it's to ground yourself to to bring yeah. you within the same vib vibrational frequency as the Earth. Yeah. Well. There's a scientific basis for it right there. So that thought, yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it might sound like New Age hoo-hoo, but <laughs> seems like they're right. There's something to it, yeah. There's something to that. Mm. Um, so we found that 
that within our, our DNA is actually attuned to the same resonance and frequency of the earth and, and such. And so the ancients knew this. Yeah. So they knew this and the correlation between harmonic stones and the earth and even electromagnetism. Now, this is where I want to talk about some of the, um, the links between sun worship and electromagnetism. Yeah. Um, and I want to go over to Peru in this particular case and go to Hayamaka. Okay. Hayamaka is called the Gate of the Gods. Right. And it's located uh, near Lake Titicaca. <laughs> don't know why I rung that bell. There's nothing funny about that, is there? <laughs> no, nothing. It really isn't. No, not a thing. <laughs> um, and it's an incredible stone monument um, that's carved into a sandstone rock face. So a cliff right. that's located in Peru. Um, it features a doorway, like um, a doorway like carving that's that measures seven meters up and seven meters across. Um, yeah. And at the base of it, it features a much smaller recess, um, but it's in the shape of a T, very much like the T pillars from Gobekli Tepe. Oh, yeah, okay. Very, very similar shape. Um, what's interesting as well is in the middle of that T, a T-shaped doorway, let's call it, there is a small circular recess, so another recess within it. Right, okay. Almost like you would put something in there. Maybe right. like a, yeah. a sun disc, sun or disc or like something. That, yeah, which is yeah. something that was uh, <laughs> very prominent in that in those cultures from yeah. that part of the world, the Mesoamerican cultures. So this ancient site was discovered in 1996, uh, just by chance, and it was by a local tour guide, Jose Luis Delgado Manani. And according to local law, the massive stone door was a portal, yeah. which the heroes of the past entered to join their gods. So stories also say that, that some of the heroes were actually able to return through this portal mm. uh, with the gods just to inspect the, the world that they left behind, just to see if it changed or anything. Yeah. So where the idea is that there was a huge amount of time passing in between those two events, yeah. between them going through the door and then coming back. Right. Um, the Quechuan people, um, they're in the indigenous natives, uh, tell a story of when the Spanish first um, came to conquer South America and they had attempted to convert the natives to Catholicism. Um, you know, what with it being the Spanish Inquisition and, yeah. and such, who no one expected. <laughs> the indigenous people, obviously, they resisted, you know, yeah. and, and they resisted the, the Spanish rule and they, they were actually chased all the way across towards the Andes. And it said at this site, the last emperor uh, went to Hyamarca, stepped up to the doorway with a small device in his hands. He then placed the device in a small notch that's in the wall, like I said it is, um, and the rock within the doorway disappeared and he walked through with, with the promise of aid. So he's gone, don't worry, guys, I'm going to go and get help. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah, I'll be right no. back. <laughs> They're all waiting there patiently, <laughs> the Spanish at their backs and uh, coming toward them. But geographically and geologically, it's a very interesting site because I've mentioned that it's um, a sandstone um, cliff face and it's yep. a it's a high density of quartz in this particular sandstone ah, as well. I was waiting for that to turn up. Yeah, I know you were. <laughs> and talking about piezoelectric quartz. So piezoelectric quartz is a form of quartz that when compressed emits an electromagnetic charge. So I've said it before about the little quartz watches that you've got. Mm -hmm. They don't have a battery. They have a very, very small crystal in them. And that's why you never need a battery with a quartz watch. And that was one of their mm. POS, you know, right, one yeah. of their points of sale. Um, so High Marker is actually located in very close proximity to the Nazca South American fault line where intense compressions occur. Right, okay. Um, <clears throat> close structures, uh, they have a, it has a close structural uh, resemblance to um, Tiwanaku, uh, which is in Bolivia, and the gate of the sun and there's five other sites in south america that have got this same sort of structure so an idea is that there's the seven meters by seven meters carving is actually like a an archway with a door in the middle right okay and that is featured in at least six other sites in south america right what's stranger still with this um if you draw straight lines mm. from each of these then you find that it crosses over the center of the plateau for Lake Titicaca 
and one of the most sacred sites within the region. Researchers have even found the remains of a city submerged under Lake Titicaca that predates all known cultures within the region. Wow. Much like the uh, Gate of the Sun, Higher Marker is still positioned um, to be fully illuminated in the sunrise at the summer solstice. Wow. Okay. So again, everything's directed towards so the sun. It's all directed the at the sun, yeah. Oh, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. But the last bit I want to go go over. Now this, <laughs> this was really eye-opening, so much so that I, I wrote this first off in all my notes. Right, um, okay. And this is actual real fact here. And this is, this is the existence of portals. Right. Portals actually exist, guys. And I found this on the NASA website. Wow, okay. So this was um, a study that was spearheaded by uh, Jack Scudder, uh, University of Iowa, and he discovered what he named X points. So, and this was a NASA funded uh, research. Now observations by NASA's Themis uh, spacecraft and Europe's uh, cluster probes suggest that, uh, that these magnetic portals open and close dozens of times each day. Now, just to give you an idea as to what they are, it's when the electromagnetic wave from the sun corresponds with the electromagnetic wave of the earth. And these portals um, open up around, around about anywhere between, well, well, they're tens of thousands of kilometers away from the earth's atmosphere. Right. So okay. they just open up um, and off they pop sort of thing but they're open and closing several times a day, dozens of times a day, and uh, seemingly in unpredictable fashion. Right, okay. So most of these portals are small and short-lived, and others are large and open much longer. Energetic particles can flow through these openings, heating the Earth's upper atmosphere, sparking geomagnetic storms, and igniting bright polar auroras. Oh, okay. Mm. So in 2014, NASA, NASA actually launched a new mission called MMS, or Magnet Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission. So this mission consists of four spacecraft, which are equipped with electric, uh, uh, sorry, energetic particle detectors and magnetic sensors, which spread out into the Earth's magnetosphere, Right. and surround the portals to observe how they work. Now, these portals, they're invisible, um, and they're unstable when they are elusive. But Jack Scudder actually had a solution, and I quote him here, portals, from via, portals form via the process of magnetic reconnection, mingling lines of magnetic force from the sun and the earth crisscross and join to create these openings. X points. X points are where the crisscross takes place. These sudden joining of magnetic fields can propel jets of charged particles from the X point, creating electron diffusion region. So either that or just X points. Yeah. To learn how to pinpoint these events, Scudder studied data from a space probe that orbited the Earth more than 20 years ago. So in the late 90s, NASA's polar spacecraft spent years in the Earth's magnetosphere and it encountered many X points during its mission. Now, if you try to go onto the NASA website and you'll be able to see how this data was um, presented. Mm. So they present it in an image form and, yeah, it forms basically an X um, at where these portals start off. So basically because of the data that was, that was found from this polar spacecraft, they were able to equip the the four spacecraft with the sensors mm. that the Polar had in order to locate these portals when they open and so they can monitor them. And what's more interesting is that these four spacecraft, when they locate a portal, they move to it and they form a pyramid around it. Right, okay. That is Which interesting. Is, it yeah. might be might be a four sided pyramid. Yeah. Um but it's still a pyramid. Pyramid nonetheless, yeah. I think that's right. I think I've got that right. But yeah, um, so he found 
he found that that data from the polar um, spacecraft would work with this new mission. So using, again, I'll, I'll quote Scudder again, using polar data, we have found five simple combinations of magnetic field and energetic particle measurements that tell us when we've come across an X point. A single spacecraft properly instrumented can make these measurements. This means that um, in a, sing a single member of the MMS constellation uh, spacecrafts, using the diagnostics can find a portal and alert the other members of the constellation, right. which further means that Scudder's observation of Polar's data has fast-tracked this particular mission and has allowed NASA to find an these signposts that the portals create. So think of it like this, right? If these portals are created by the connections of electromagnetic fields of yep. two large bodies of mass, then by using these the magnetosphere of these connections, one could literally piggyback from one portal to another, much like they do in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume yeah. 2 when they make the 700 jumps. Yeah. It's, it's technically... It's technically Technically correct. possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's I mean, getting back to those, the idea of the signposts, though, is it possible that ancient cultures had a strong understanding of them and how to utilize them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There is scientific basis there. So, yeah, it kind of appears like I've gone <laughs> A to B to Z to, to D. M. <laughs> yeah. Gone all over the place. But, yeah, I hope you guys can follow that. Mm. That I wanted to build up a, an understanding of ancient cultures link to the sun at yeah. the very least and also just how in tuned they were with the earth itself mm. and how they were seemingly able to harness that shared energy between the earth and the, the sun mm. before any any technology i mean that was their technology i guess which is well portals do exist yeah we know this is a scientific fact that mm. nasa is studying right now portals exist yeah. and they are constantly monitoring them yeah so um give the the idea as, as to exactly what it is that they do so i want to explain it a little bit more with regards to the northern and southern lights that we see in the sky right. they don't occur every every day no they only occur under certain conditions and those certain conditions is when those charged particles come come directly from the sun's atmosphere so this is what i want to make sure that people understand is these portals open to the sun's atmosphere mm. so these charged particles are coming directly from the sun which is 93 million miles away and hitting the Earth's atmosphere instantly. Whereas previously, I believe it takes something like five or six minutes right. for that radiation mm. to actually hit the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. So it might not sound like a, a long time, but cosmologically, that's like, that's really, really quick. Yeah. Really, really quick. Like instant a travel. of an ice all quick, yeah. Absolutely. So when these portals are open, these charged particles come in, they hit the electromagnetic field of the Earth, and it takes it either to the North Pole or the South Pole, and that's when we get those auroras. Mm. Um, so, yeah, theoretically, if we were able to understand yeah. exactly how to charge particles in the same way, yeah. potentially we could travel through them as well. Did they learn to harness that energy and so to open these... Um, you know these portals or mm. you know these these doorways that were they able to harness it in in such a way that they were able to then communicate with whoever was on the other side uh, assuming there was you yeah know, sort of anyone or whether it was just to a different part of the world and say a different culture was found or a different you know civilization is that why there was such a you know etymology between cultures that may never have actually you know met based on where they were geographically but yeah. somehow share so many coincidences mm. if you like with, uh, is with it, regards to is it um star sirius that is um in the orion belt as well i don't know i'll be honest i, I don't I'll know. have to double check that but i believe yeah. there is a one of the closest stars that we've got potentially if you were able to find the merging of those electromagnetic fields between mm. our sun and and sirius yeah um i believe sirius is the closest star to us right um which is where they say a lot of these various different alien beings came from right um, that makes sense. That potentially, mm. if those electromagnetic fields made X points, yeah, and certainly made those X points a lot closer to us, yeah, then they could travel within the blink of an eye. 
Yeah, true. And potentially we could go there. Or yeah, although I mean, this this kind of leads into one of my you know theories. But you know, back then they wouldn't have had any other interference between the energy you know shared between the Earth and the Sun and you know its other sort of closest stars. So mm. whereas now, because we've got you know radio waves, microwaves, and everything else, you know, are these signals unable to, I guess sort of penetrate through that which is why now these um x marks x points yeah x points sorry um you know sort of thousands and thousands of miles above you know sort of the earth whereas back in the day they wouldn't have had any, any interference so yeah, could they have come down sort of closer which is why they were able to harness it and you know and seemingly use them well potentially if different parts of the world well where I said about I these these particular points where they say that portals exist on the Earth's surface, yeah. they tend to be highly linked mm. with quartz crystals, yeah. or at least stones that are in high crystal content as well. Yeah. So, which as I explained very briefly about the piezoelectric um, quartz yeah. emanating an electromagnetic uh, force mm. or energy, then you you take that watch and you make it on a much larger scale mm. like say on a fault line yeah with the the gate of the gods yeah potentially under the right conditions yeah electromagnetic fields could yeah. interlink and the open same these thing, portals yeah. very very briefly yeah yeah almost it, like extending the signal to where you want it to be sort of thing mm. yeah or where, so to that, where you think you can heighten it yeah yeah absolutely it's interesting yeah incredible stuff yeah, really definitely. and i'm glad that yeah, <laughs> you, you, you've enjoyed that as well, and I hope that the listeners have enjoyed it because I did That's go on good. for a fair old bit, a good chunk right there. It's, uh, yeah, a lot of it, as suspected, a lot of it has kind of tied into kind of my you know theories, um, you know, in terms of how I've gone about answering um, James's uh, questions. Less um, factual to an extent, it's more kind of theory based, just on what I feel based on what we've read and yeah. what I've watched and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, luckily you've sort of mentioned it and oh, mate, done a bit of a deep dive on it, whereas I've sort of glossed over it, so that kind of will marry up. Yeah, like I said, this is quite right nicely. up my alley, this sort of thing, really. I like, yeah. this is, I love this sort of thing, looking into the facts and looking into ancient cultures, Yeah, what it seems like they did. Mm. Um, so much so, I've even thought about looking into an open university course for anthropology, because I think that's, well, yeah. it's just fascinating. Yeah, oh, it definitely is. The stuff that we don't get taught about. No. No, I mean, I'm a, you know, relative newbie in uh, in comparison, but yeah, certainly, certainly fascinating. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, but like I said at the start, I I went about answering um, James's sort of question or, or questions by quite literally breaking them up mm. question by question, really. And, and I, I started off with six, but I combined the first two. So I've got five, okay, yeah. I've, I've got the, the sort of five sort of segments, which... Um, and I've written them out, so uh, I guess I'll um, read through the, the yeah, particular segment it, and, then, yeah. and then follow up with my um, so, sort of answer, yeah, you've if that makes it, sense. You've got it linked up with the, the various questions. So Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. What, so what, what have you got to say about the, the first part? So the first part I'll, I'll reread um, for the, uh, the listeners. Um, what if the said event and high strangeness go hand in hand? A civilization of people able to pass through or interact with different realms merely wiped out by a mass extinction event. So that kind of, my, my sort of theory sort of links on from what you mentioned um, earlier um, regarding the uh, Younger Dryas event that happened, what, 12,850 years ago. Yeah. Um, and as you said, the impact was from uh, meteor fragments that hit um, North America, South America and, and, and parts of Europe. Meltwater from the North Atlantic um, could have forced a superior race of uh, of humans to move basically down through Europe, um, and here they would have met a civilization that we more commonly know, which were the uh, Neanderthals, um, and basically attempted to integrate into that community because their own was wiped out by the, the melt flood. Gotcha. Um, basically. Um, from this integration with the Neanderthals, um, technology, knowledge and wisdom was shared. So I suppose you could argue that they were superior because, you know, they were wiped out, mm -hmm. but the 
Neanderthals weren't. They were more survivors. They were more kind of boots on the ground sort of, um, you know, sort of mentality. Whereas if they were a higher being that maybe were more about, you know, sort of technology and other things, they maybe weren't quite as equipped. Yeah, well, the, the idea that we, that a, a large advanced culture could mm. live alongside hunter gatherers. Yeah, basically, yeah. Is not unheard of because no. we do that today. Yeah. We've got these various different islands and, and isolated tribes that are mm. still in the Stone Age, are still yeah. hunter gatherers. Yeah, very much so. And if, say, a, a huge disaster happened again, so the counter theory to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis is to do with solar flares. So yeah. there was a, a major um, corona, no, is that what do they call it? A corona mass ejection, right. which hit the earth and basically caused these geomagnetic storms across the planet, mm. melted the water, melted the ice, yeah. uh, volcano. Basically it created the same effects, but it just wasn't an impact. It was pretty much like the film 2012, yeah. Where the, it basically calls lightning strikes, thunderstorms, earthquakes, volcano eruptions that were once dormant and that kind of thing. And just basically every bit of carnage you can imagine, natural carnage, the one, was sparked by... The main progenitor of that one uh, yeah. I've come across is uh, Professor Robert Schock, um, who's a geologist. Mm. Um, he's often been on Joe yeah. Rogan as well. Yeah. Um, but his work on it, he done, mm. he done some great dating of the Sphinx. Um in, yes, in Giza. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, yeah, yeah. So go check out Robert Shock's yeah. <laughs> dating of the Sphinx, um, and the more to do with the water erosion in mm. the Sphinx uh, quarry. Yeah, that, that is interesting. His mm. um, his theory on that, which again kind of links into all of this, um, really. But um, yeah, so it was believed that there was an integration of a yeah superior kind of human race um, with Neanderthals and. Yeah, there was technology, knowledge, and you know, sort of wisdom shared as as part of the, I suppose, this newfound civilization or you know relationship, I guess. Um, and it's this interaction that led to various carvings and stone sculptures um, to be found at sites like um, Gebekli Tepe um, in Turkey yes. and Tali and Tali. Antonia. Anatoly. Anatolia. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is what Anatolia it would have been known. was the old yeah. Uh, form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and as well as uh, carvings uh, and paintings of animals and signs of religion, um, the site is also home to a circular stone structure, which again you sort of alluded to um, earlier. Um, and it's similar to that of Stonehenge, for those that want to kind of try and imagine what it may well look like. Yeah, it's 50 times bigger than Stonehenge. Um, wow, right. They've only, yeah, because they've only uncovered, um, I think something ridiculous, like 5%. And oh, it, right. it was uh, a, a German doctor, Klaus Schmidt, mm. or, uh, archaeologist, sorry, not necessarily a doctor, but an archaeologist that, that found it and started yeah. the excavation. He's That's right. since passed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's because of ground penetrating radar, they've been able to find this 50 times bigger than Stonehenge. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and I uh, mean, Gobekli Tepe is a fascinating site because it's some really um, advanced carving. So yes, it's not carving yeah. into the stone, is it? It's carving around it's, it and embossing. Yeah, it's almost embossing. It's, it's like 3D carvings. So yeah, as you said, they've not carved into the stone. They've, to create they've, the they've image. carved the stone away to leave the image that they, that they wanted. Very um, advanced. But yeah, yeah, very uh, advanced, certainly for that, you know, sort of time when you compare it to what we would know as like the, you know, primitive cave paintings and, and things that have been found. Of that sort of time period. Of that time well. period, yeah. And then this popped up and it's like, hold on, that doesn't, that doesn't stack up. Well, Gobekli yeah. Tepe was covered. So it wasn't, um, so it was purposefully covered mm. around about 10,000 years ago, mm. which, why would they, Cover it, unless to preserve it, like a time capsule sort of thing. Yeah, possibly. Why would but you? Why else would you cover it up? Yeah, unless there was something, there was something down there that you didn't want to be found, or a use that you didn't want to be. Yeah. you didn't want someone to harness. Yes, it wasn't covered over. Like, just so you guys know, it wasn't covered over by um, sediment or anything like, like a flash flood or something, which we mm. know did did actually happen. Yeah. A flash flood did actually hit that far inland, and it basically it hit as far as Mount Ararat. Mm. 
you know, where Noah landed his ark. And yeah. There is an ark that was found at the top of Mount yeah. Ararat. They well did find a boat, boat. yeah. Yeah. Matching the dis- the dimensions yeah. that are in We know there. that a flood event happened, so yeah. yeah. It's, it's maybe maybe not as mystical or biblical as maybe, maybe not, it's been made out. Maybe not the uh, the Old Testament, at the very least. Yeah. Because that's where that story comes from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, sorry, man. Go no, that's all right. No, that's cool. Um, so in, in terms of the passing through realms, um, I think the like, likely scenario um, is that they probably descended into the earth um, and this this falls into uh, us put our theory or you know put my theory from the last episode um, to avoid the destruction of the earth finding um, basic salvation under the earth would kind of make sense mm. if they've seen what's happened uh, you know above with this you know ice melt sort of flood did they seek refuge in caves and subsequently find that there was you know sort of more there and that's how they sustained you know, kind of life. So I, I suppose um, it's, it, I've, I've sort of, and I'd like come onto it again in one of his other questions, but I'd, I sort of have interpreted the use of the word, sort of, you know, sort of portal or, or realm as more just like a physical doorway. Uh, more like an like archetype a, rather than being an actual yeah, portal. Like an actual, okay, yeah, yeah, sort of sci fi sort of portal in that respect. It, it, for the purposes of the, you know, these sort of questions. Anyway, I know obviously you've provided the, you know, the NASA data, which is really compelling about the fact that it actually exists. So I also found out something really, really interesting yesterday. Again, a scientific discovery. Yeah. They found and theorized that there is more water within the Earth's crust than there is on the surface of the Earth. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we only know what, 5% of the. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the, the, the ocean bed. Yeah. We know nothing about what's in the Mariana yeah. Trench. We yeah. know nothing, mate. No. Well, I can't get down we there, supposedly. John Snore. But John Snore. We know <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this, this civilization could have traveled between dimensions or, or realms that would also fit in, fits into my theory of how cryptids like the Fae and Bigfoot would move around and about our yeah, sort of reality. Yeah. So that there's there's two possibilities to, you know, the use of the word portal or, or realm. It, it could be in the, the sort of the more mystical sense that you actually are, you know, walking through something to then appear somewhere else. Or it could actually be the, the more sort of physical form and that by portal it just means doorway. Well, yeah, or, that's... Or, that, you know, entrance, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, there's I've, I've, I've sort of... I'm sort of firmly on, firmly on the fence, really, with that one. I don't really know which way, because there's science that we now know that kind of supports both. So, yeah, it's it's one of those that's both are possibilities. One's probably more likely than the other, and I think that's probably why I'm leaning more towards the, the sort of the inner earth thing. Uh, the the metaphor of crossing, like crossing yeah. the threshold. Yes. So, like, yeah, going yeah. from one, one room to another. Essentially. Yeah, basically, yeah, like that kind of Simplifying thing. Simplifying it a bit much, but... That's more or less, yeah, gotcha. that, that's, that's more or less it, I'd say. Um it is and has been believed that um, these higher beings or more advanced humans have, have visited us before to, you know, impart wisdom and, you know, provide warnings, um, two of which we've previously uh, covered, the likes of, you know, Injured Cold and Valiant Thor. Um, and so could they have travelled between realms only to seek refuge underground? Because, you know, there's strong reports that these beings, these, these two guys existed, and that they they would seek refuge on Earth, that's but nothing's been found of them, you know, sort of since. So that's true. So could that be a a sort of an explanation for you know for them? Yeah. You know, we know that Admiral Bird actually met with you know a, a higher being, a a, a a master. I think he called himself yeah, the master. Wasn't the it? master. That was right. Um, not Jeff Goldblum's no master. <laughs> no, not that one. No, it's although it'd be awesome day. if it was. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be awesome if it was. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum just walks out in all his glory. <laughs> and it's him. Jeff Goldblum yeah. is the master. He's the master, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um so yeah, so I think that you know that's a possible, you know explanation for, yeah, for those I think it, you know, kind of as as well. Um using the whole inner earth um you know, sort of theory. Um, you know, with such a compelling account from Admiral Bird as well. So Again, we're talking about, you know, realms, you know, are we just talking about, like, like you say, threshold going from, 
you know, outer earth to, you know, inner earth and, you know, living more internally as opposed to externally, I guess. Or within in, like uh, an, another dimension or anything like yeah. that. Rather than, rather than it being another dimension, you're thinking about it being a bit more physical. Yes. A bit more material. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. More or less. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. Leading on from that, technically inner earth could be a realm of sorts um, as it does have certain passageways, as we know, dotted around. Or most of where the impact sites were, you know, sort of would have been, you know, sort of from what we know, you know, as well. Absolutely, yeah, the northern hemisphere, and when we think about yeah. Hyperborea and yeah, all in that part of the yeah. world. So, um, so yes, that's kind of the my interpretation of the first point. So hopefully, James, I've done it justice. Um, the second part um, that, I've, that I've broke off is. Um, could some of these have been able to escape this realm in the form of a ritual portal? Um, now just following off from what I said before, in this instance, I'm interpreting the use of the word portal simply as doorway or door, basically, in the physical sense. Um, as previously described, um, I'd find it more likely that any advanced civilization would be using doorways um, as portals in, you know, in the earth. Um, they would again. They would have seen the destruction following the Younger Dryas impact and sought refuge underground. Now we know that some of the entrances are believed to be in the areas where the impacts occurred. Now, did some escape, you know, through these, um, or were they created afterwards as a means of escape? Outwards, so as a means to escape um, the, the impact, the after and the, and the, effect, yeah, sort of the aftermath of the. Of the you know, the sort fallout. of the impact. Yeah, the fallout. Yeah. You know, were okay. they either found or created as part of the, you know, fallout, or was it already known that they were there mm. and they were used, you know, accordingly, I guess? I guess so, yeah. Because, I mean, it's, there's more and more um, stuff that archaeologists are finding that suggests that um, ancient cultures had a technology mm. that allowed them to mould stone. Yeah. So, potentially drilling yeah. into an inner earth much system or yeah big drilling operation basically yeah. like yeah. primitive version i guess as a you know as a, as a theory to kind of offer up um you know of course with how much in in tune early man was you know with earth the ability to communicate to communicate sorry with other civilizations was was more possible i would say um again feeding off from what i said um in answer to the last question, um, I believe monuments like the Great Pyramids of, of Giza, Stonehenge and uh, Chichen Itza um, are almost like towers to help amplify said signal. Yeah, because we were talking about this just before we started recording. Yeah. And talking about, because I've been inside Stonehenge, mm. but actually within the circles themselves. And that's a really, really interesting one because, again, um, the blue stones, or what they also call them, the healing stones, mm. are made of basalt. Basalt, in particular, is really, really high in crystal content. Yeah. Um, the sarsen stones are sandstone as well, mm. which again has a high crystal content. Yeah. And but the acoustics inside that circle, mm. very, very odd. And Salisbury Plain is is exactly as described. As it is a plane, yeah. It's a plane which just rolled like slow rolling, rolling hills. hills. So yeah. sound travels over that really, really well. And when mm. you're inside that circle, it's like not even, you can't even hear the wind. It, you can hear everyone else inside the circle. But not, not much outside of it. No. Yeah. No, it's weird. It's like, it's like a weird <laughs> sort of bubble. That yeah. Stuff can't penetrate. Yeah. Like, um, uh, what was his name? The, um, Oh, I could find me notes. <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? Joe Parr. Who did okay, experiments yeah, so on did the, the, the pyramids yeah. and found the, the energy mm. thing. Um, similar thing happens at Chichen Itza as well, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it does from the angle in which the um, temple or, or pyramids have been um, built and their sort of location on the, on the ground um, acoustically carries... Um, it's like, sound. It's like it was made to speak to like tens of thousands of people. So like one person yeah. could stand on top of one of these or stand on a platform. And mm. like, because we was talking about this, was, I, yeah. I found this, um, I remember who it was that said it, but they said they went to Chichen Itza and um, their tour guide was really, really good. And he said, right, everyone just stand here. There must have been about 300 people on this mm. tour. And he went up the pyramid and it went, 
hello, whispered, whispered and every single person heard the whisper. whisper. Yeah. And he explained that this was built so they could speak to tens of thousands of yeah. people without speakers mm. or something, you know, it's just. So, yeah, so it's evidence that. Understanding of sound, just incredible. Yeah, and just acoustics and stuff. And, and, and so, you know, there's evidence there that it's an amplifier of, of sound. So what else could it be used to, you know, amplify? Sound is just is, electromagnetic yeah, frequencies. Exactly, yeah. Um, now, whether that signal, um, you know, is being sent on this earth or, you know, beyond the stars or another realm or, or dimension, you know, there is there is evidence that, you know, that we've already gone over that, especially at those three locations, that would suggest that they are a amplifier of, of signals, um, but more of these natural frequencies that you obviously alluded to earlier. Um, in the, the sciencey bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought I'd bring the science? Oh, no. <laughs> um, science, yeah, so that's bitch. Science, bitch. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, um, yeah, that, I mean, that, that kind of, so what I said before I started, you know, a lot of the, the science and the factual stuff that, you know, that you've brought to the, the table kind of helps to an extent back up a lot of my, you know, yeah. sort of, you know, theories, um, which is quite, quite handy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Um, now I'm sure, um, you know, in this time and by this time, you know, I mean, you know, sort of back when Chichen Itza would have been first constructed, uh, same with you know, sort of Stonehenge, um, that uh, rituals, uh, maybe even sacrifices, were made um, when communication was made using these uh, sites, maybe as a way to either strengthen the the, the signal um, or to kind of set the intention of the signal to know that it would be, you know received at the other end and again that could be somewhere else on this earth another geographical location or it, you know it could be another realm or gotcha even you know sort of beyond the sort of beyond the stars um now what these you know rituals were specifically or you know i'm not sure but it's almost in almost entirely possible that it would have that it would have happened mm. um you know in in that respect um so yeah, so again, ho hopefully, <laughs> I've you know I've, I've uh, you know gone about answering that, and uh, you know if they would escape, and you know, well, it's only like we're marrying up with what we found and and what you're theorising. Yeah. Well. So yeah, I mean, so something I, to I it. I don't think but... we, I don't think we've quite got the answer. We haven't no. got because we're certainly not the men to find the <laughs> no, answer. Absolutely not. <laughs> but. I've really enjoyed looking into this. So like, yeah, yeah. Pose it, yeah, it's been good to pose kind of the, the possibilities and, you know, you know, sort of my theories to it. Cause like I say, I'm, I'm, you know, a relative newbie to this in the, mm. you know, the grand scheme of things. So I'm almost looking at this kind of, you know, with, with sort of fresh eyes, you know, I've got no preconceived, you know, sort of ideas or anything. Yeah. So it's literally whatever I'm finding is kind of what I'm going with, you know, at the moment, wrongly or rightly. Gotcha. Um, but that's kind of where I'm, I'm sort of finding myself. Um, now, Part three um, that I've sort of broken down uh, is the bit where James asks, um, did some sorcerers, priests or druids stay to stabilise the portals and or open it at a later date? Have they been partially left open? Um, now, I think personally that any any such portal could be stabilised or controlled from, from either side. So I don't think they, anyone would necessarily need to have stayed like here on our side to mm. sort of achieve that. Um, plus, if I stick with my, you know, sort of thoughts or, or, or theory, this would be more of a physical doorway, then there'd be no need to stabilise it at all, maybe, you know, to guard it, you know, if if anything else. Mm. Um, which, you know, we've since, um, you know, sort of found with the, uh, with the Arctic and uh, the sort of the ways that these entrances are, are, are sort of guarded or, or hidden. Indeed. Yeah. Um, you know, she will say so again. It kind of lends itself to to that if you if you buy into that you know account. Um, however, if they did stick around um, and integrate into lesser civilizations like the Neanderthals, um, then as seen at um, Gebekli Tepe, uh, it was to share technologies, knowledge, and wisdom. So, yeah, it, it was. I, I would say. <laughs> It was more to probably stabilize us as a species, mm. as opposed to any 
you know, kind of doorways and stuff. I think that was just their means of, you know, traveling, okay. traveling yeah. back and forth. I think that the stabilization would have been with the civilization that they found because they stabilizing would have, of the DNA. Yeah, and, basically, because they would have held themselves at a higher, in a higher esteem, no doubt, and so they would have imparted all this, you know, wisdom and stuff as a way to think. No, oh, we're doing you a favor here. We're going to put you on the right path to evolve a bit quicker or yeah. you know do you see what i mean so the, i think the, that it was the more, savior sort of thing yeah almost. So it's more to stabilize that than any physical sort of traveling mm. if that make you know if that I makes sense so. um and you know based on how we developed as a, a species i believe any such portals or doorways were sealed to prevent further communication um the things we've done to each other in history um seemingly is against what these other beings would consider the right way to behave <laughs> or yeah. or you know to do things um but the you know superior civilizations were wiped out or at least depleted in you know by great numbers and it was the more primitive um neanderthals or or hunter gatherers yeah um that actually survived so are the aboriginal tribes in the amazon actually the superior the superior race as opposed to us for example using a, a sort of a oh i see a comparison okay, so that they're like the the last remaining ones sort of thing yeah the, more yeah from the previous number, deluge yeah, because they they you know live off the land you know they I they, understand. they touch okay. the land they're more in you know in tune with it are they actually ahead of the game as opposed to us with all this technology and all these you know distractions so these kind of super beings were they because you know they got depleted or almost entirely wiped out Mm. they obviously weren't quite as superior as they as they thought so well we certainly aren't as superior as we as we know and we're not our civilization we're not now incredibly delicate Mm. incredibly delicate if we were to have another impact or Another time period like the Younger Dryas, where mm. it all turns to shit. Yeah, we'd, we'd be eating each other within weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it'd be the tribes that would be the ones that'd be thriving because to them there'd be you know next to no sort of they're difference. They're untouched. They, they survive every day and they're up against the elements, predators, whatever it may like be. You say more in tune with the world. More in tune with it all. So you know, would they just adapt? Yeah. quickly or certainly quicker than well our silicon so, based technology us. mate is, like i say is so delicate like all you need is an emp to go off yeah so an, an electromagnetic pulse to mm. go off and yeah. we lose it all guys you lose us yeah you lose <laughs> these videos you might not be a bad thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, all of it yeah all of it goes or the power grid goes like for instance the, do you know how many power grids they've got in america to think yeah. like on the North American continent across the United States, they've got three. They've got really? East, they've got West, and Texas. Texas has got his own. Texas, <laughs> Texas of course, has got his own. <laughs> but honestly, if one of them was to go down, mm. then that whole region would turn to shit within a matter of weeks. Blimey, that, that's how delicate yeah. our system is. Always, are, always resting on a on a knife edge. So all these um, Ray Mears and, and mm. uh, all these survivalist guys, maybe even yeah. Bear Grylls, I don't know, yeah. maybe, you know, he, he might be able to tell you how to book a hotel. But Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly, but, yeah. Uh, or, yeah, book a hotel and drink your own piss. Yeah. Um, maybe these guys are worth listening to on how yeah, to maybe. survive with the elements. And yeah. maybe, guys, maybe just get yourself out there into a bit of nature every now and then. Yeah. It might be good for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, just a final point on... On that question, um, you know, could could these, you know, civilizations or you know tribes, could they be the ones stabilizing the energy output, you know, from the Earth because they're not as blocked as we are, with all the technology and waves, microwaves, radio waves that we are seemingly distracted by. Mm. So are they the sort of the balance between the Earth's frequencies and where, just- because they're still operating it how it would have been you know sort of back in the day as it were yeah yeah absolutely in that respect. I mean, we've already established um the idea of the serpent worships uh yeah serpent worshippers and, and such and, mm. and we know that the serpent has always been um associated with knowledge you know what we've yeah. the serpent giving eve the, the yeah. from the tree of knowledge mm. um you know and 
to suggest that, I mean, we know that they were wiped out and they're wiped out within Christian symbology as well. Mm. So are were they the last um, yeah. civilization? Yeah. That actually knew how to do all of this. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. And, I, and you are, you're right. We are constantly surrounded by various different waves, radiation waves, yeah. even sitting here right now. Mm. So, yeah, if exactly, none of yeah. this existed, would we be able to be in tune with, yeah. be a lot more aware of everything else that's happening around us? Yeah, I think we would be would start to be more aware, but would it be an instant thing? No, no. Generations, I think, before we got back to it. Um, so yeah, so again, hopefully that's kind of answered the uh, sort of the question in terms of have they been partially left open? Possibly, mm. I think they poss- I think they possibly have. If you believe certain interactions and and, and sort of theories, and you know, and technically with your NASA stuff earlier, then they are constantly open. Yeah, <laughs> so opening, closing, dozen times a day. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so again, it's um, yeah. A, a, sort of a, a couple of answers depending on which way you want to go but um yeah again I'm, i think i'm probably leaning towards the more kind of physical um element of you know the word portal mm. i guess rather, um, than me- rather than the metaphysical than the metaphysical yeah exactly gotcha. um so that brings me on to point four question four should i say um has the knowledge of these portals and how to react with them um slowly been lost over time um my answer to that is that you know the knowledge was probably lost at some point um you know when mankind couldn't be trusted with such knowledge and all power um i believe this is why a lot of these types of sightings um were last documented you know well at least um a long time ago um it's probably no coincidence that the you know biblical texts and ancient scriptures mention these types of powers and interactions with mm. you know sort of greater beings i think there's a i think there's a fairly obvious reason as to why it was so far back that a lot of these really compelling ones were noted and and documented um because they had the natural ability to do so and to receive these signals or these you know frequencies to you know to kind of know what it was yeah yeah, you know, if right. we if we got them today, we'd just think that our you know Wi Fi got knocked out or <laughs> our phone signal was down. We wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah, so. yeah we wouldn't know. So I yeah. think that's why you know when, when you you know read a lot of the ancient Egypt stuff and you know a lot of the biblical stuff, it mentions all of these you know sort of interactions, and you think it's maybe just you know stories for the purposes of you know why it was intended. But is there actually some element of truth you know to it? Well, absolutely. I think it's it's certainly worth. I mean. <sighs> I know we do talk about the Bible a lot, but and we're certainly not. Uh, I think we've made it very aware that we're not religious no. sort of people in that respect. And yeah, definitely. Certainly don't. I certainly don't subscribe to monotheism, which mm. is the idea yeah. of the Abrahamic religions and, and such. I, I do have my own belief systems and, and whatnot. But if you were to actually read the Old Testament mm. word for word and forget about ecclesiastical art, yeah, you know, and the depictions of cherubs and angels and Oh, 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 the halos and all of that. Yeah. Forget about all of that and read the descriptions of stuff. Mm. And I'm going to sound a bit like Eric von Daniken here, yeah. but it's all aliens. You know, it's just like I'm not saying it's aliens. It's the UFOs. It's the, your your force. Your force. It, yeah, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. But it's aliens. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, just take the time mm. if you can. If you're actually genuinely interested in this sort of stuff, go and read what it yeah. actually says and. You'd be you'd, you'd be surprised. Yeah, I think blow your mind. Yeah, it's it's diff- it's it's interesting. You know, sort of for sure. Um, but yeah, just so just following on from the the sort of the you know loss of you know sort of power or knowledge, I, I would say that it's only rose to prominence really. You know, recently, and I say in you know, a sort of few hundred years, because some modern day humans are probably just naturally gifted, um, or some are more in tune with the earth and its energy. Which is why I think you know you get people like mediums and yeah, even some sort of you know sort of pagans practicing witches and you know and that kind of thing. Um, people that hone in you know sort of what they believe to be you know kind of magic. It's, you know, it's probably just the Earth's energy, and because no one else you know can do it or uh, or or they're not as in tune you mm. know sort of with it. Um, you know that's why they have these 
sort of abilities. You know, in, what? That, in that respect, I subscribe exactly to that. And I mentioned it again just as we was coming in. I was mentioning <laughs> about this new book that that me, Did. And, me and Sam, my better half, mm. found last night, and just yeah. by the, the the summary of it, mm. um, it sounds like an incredible read. I found it yeah. on Audible. So I'm going to be listening to that. That's right, sure. okay, cool. And it's uh, The Awakened Mind by Lisa Miller. Mm. And she puts forth this idea mm. about depression. Yeah. And it's linked to spirituality. Mm. And she, and she, she, a lot of it's anecdotal, which unfortunately it has to be because yeah. you, I don't think you can quantify spirituality in a scientific study. I think it would be hard to, yeah. It'd be very, very difficult to do it. So mm. a lot of it is anecdotal. So if you want to, you yeah. know, take it with a pinch of salt. But basically what she links is that depression is actually a calling for spirituality. Mm. So it's a process that we have to go through now because we're no longer in touch yeah. with nature, yeah. spirituality. We're no yeah. longer in sync. We're no probably not even resonating at the right mm. frequency that we yeah. should be with the earth. We're out of alignment. We're out of alignment. With our natural, yeah, and without getting too preachy, you know, people, you know, you know from my you, own experience, you and I have had our, you know, sort of experiences with it. And, um, you know, you read a lot of things about people saying, you know, you know, get off, you know, the internet, get off social media, um, you know, because these can be contributors towards, you know, certain depressive you know, symptoms. Health. Yeah. yeah, bad mental health, yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, not getting too deep on it, but you know, could it actually be not the social media or the internet specifically, but the signal that you mm. get from accessing, you know, the internet and stuff? Absolutely. Well, there is. Could, could that be a blocker to well, these we, natural frequencies? We know that um, emotion has a certain amount of energy because um, there were uh, experiments conducted with the growth of plants. Mm. And um, I, see, I'm just off the cuff here, so I forget who it is that actually conducted the experiment. I believe it was a female botanist. And she had set up um, these various different plants in these different environments. Yeah. So, um, and she was going to, to one set of plants and she was talking to them lovely, doing all the ASMR. Calm, <laughs> oh God, yeah. Putting a lot of yeah. a lot of uh, love and attention into yeah, them. Yeah, I bet. And in the other plant, she's going, "Fuck you, <laughs> fuck you, piece of shit!" Like, like giving real negativity, like anger. She was right. Like, she was thinking about anger with me. She's angering it toward those plants. Right. Right? She's getting really full on. Like yeah, yeah. I want one extreme, which is beautiful and really nice. Literally and both ends of the scale. So yeah. Fuck you. Yeah. And like, <laughs> And she actually found that there was a quantitative effect that these plants that were being told <laughs> "fuck you" and all this hate <laughs> angle toward them, they were they weren't growing so well. Yeah. So everything else was base. Yeah. Base levels. You know, they had yeah. the same amount of moisture in the air, same amount of of uh, UV light, same amount mm. of soil, same amount, same nutrients in the soil. Yeah. But the ones that were shown love, the two defining growing like yeah. mad, and then you got the plants that were being told "fuck you." Yeah. And. You they, got, yeah, you got that as well. It was just, mm. they were just, they just weren't growing. They, yeah. they were just wilting. They were growing very, if they were growing, it was growing very slowly. Mm. They were very little and there yeah. weren't much going in with it. Um, but yeah, go and check that out. Mean, there, there's yeah. a, a link between emotional to energy. It. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose I've gone down the, the, the I suppose the more, say sciencey, but like with actual, you know, kind of weight waves themselves from the, you know, the technology. So the introduction of things like, you know, microwaves, radio waves, you know, have probably helped to block out a lot of any natural, you know, sort of signals and or energy um, that would once have been a form of, you know, communication, you know, to either other civilizations or, mm. you know, superior ones. Um, and I, and I think it's all these blockers, I guess, as I'll, Use uses a umbrella term. Um, that's kind of keeping us from that, I guess. Keeping us, which uh, they wouldn't have had when it was all originally kind of going on. Which is why, yeah, they were they were able to figure out science <laughs> that we now rely on. Yeah, science, <laughs> science, son. <huh? laughs> um, and you know it getting a bit conspiratorial i guess um, for it. you know love a bit of that absolutely 
Um, you know, why why do you think sites like like Stonehenge, you know, the Great Pyramid and Chichen Itza are now, you know, sort of seemingly kept from human access? Mm. You know, you can you can only get so close most of the time. You know, they make you think it's for, you know, conservation and whatever else, but what if it's because of these frequencies and this energy? And if too many people experience it, they think, well, I've got a minute. I think, yeah, I think that's, a, that's, know, a, that's so, a good possibility. So, yeah. But I think there's far more dickheads out there that will try and chunk, like, chip off a chunk and go, oh, look, I've got a souvenir. Oh, there is that as well. Yeah. There is that as well, absolutely. <laughs> you always have to account for dickheads. <laughs> <laughs> In every walk of life. Right there, guys, that's a lesson for you. Always account for dickheads. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, exactly. And, you know, I suppose just going back to, you know, accounts like the one from Admiral Bird that we covered in the, you know, briefly in the last um, episode, you know, why do you think that this isn't well, you know, isn't too well known? Sorry. Um, you know, again, going a bit conspiratorial, but, you know, could it be cover ups? You know, um, you know, it's easier to keep it under wraps or, you know, to call him crazy um, than to actually try and explain it and, and address you know, the account. 100% agree with that. So, well, we know that the early Christians wanted to separate themselves from serpent worship. Yeah. And they destroyed everything that they possibly could to, to stop that link. Yeah. Right so there. it's happened before, is, you know, is it continually happening when things like this, you know, pop up? I, conspiracy th for you as well. Yeah. <laughs> I 100% subscribe to that. 100%. Um, now on the... And so the last point, you'll be pleased to know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> James asks, um, are later monuments an attempt to harness enough power to reenact said ritual? Mm. Um, which is, you know, it's quite a, a great question. Um, yes, possibly is the, the kind of the, the short answer. <laughs> Thank you and good night. And that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Modern ways of, of trying to, yeah, harness the, the same power. Um, an example of the Eiffel Tower in, in Paris um, was initially built as merely a, a decoration, um, but it's essentially now used as a giant radio tower. Um, so based on its size and construction, you know, could it be used by the, you know, the French government um, as a, a signal booster um, mm. to these other worlds or realms or you know, whatever we believe is, um, you know, is out there. But yeah, it, it, it sort of makes sense because um, there's, a, there's a thing going around online at the moment where they're taking all these pictures of um, these buildings that are, they're, they're cylindrical buildings, mm. much like the ones uh, um, in Moscow, the uh, the Kremlin. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Very much like that where they've got these domes on the top. Yeah. And what a lot of people online are saying, and there's a lot of whack jobs online, <laughs> But it's a theory, and it's maybe worth looking at, at the very least. At least the possibility. These are able to harness Earth energies. Um, yeah. So those electromagnetic um, waves and energies that are created by the Earth that certainly Nikola Tesla had an understanding of. Oh, yeah. Um, enable, you know, with his idea of free energy, free wireless energy at that. Um, so potentially it is possible that these things there is a cover-up of some sorts and us ants are being <laughs> told that we're buying mm. um electricity from power plants and stuff that have yeah. overheads yeah when really they might actually just be sourced freely yeah they've just known how to harness it and control it and distribute it and so that's what you actually apart from the cost of setting for. up yeah apart from the cost of setting up you you're there's yeah. no overheads yeah. to free energy. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, so in 1898, um, they actually managed to make contact from the Eiffel Tower to the Pantheon, which was about four miles away. Um, a year later, the French military um, were interested in its power and so had a station positioned permanently at the top of the tower. Um so you've got that as a you know as a that's a, interesting a, yeah that's very interesting how they were yeah. able to achieve that in what was it 1848 was it uh so it would have been 18 
1899. Oh, 1899. 98, 99. I was on the verge of like the, yeah. the 20th century. Yeah. Because uh, it was actually used as um, a communications tower for World War One. 